the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. The top quarterback in the league is lost. Veteran QBs are benched. Is there any other option in Ottawa? And what does the CFL have against nachos and cheese? This is the CFL This Week. I'm your tour guide, Bubba O'Neill. Let's introduce who's seated at this week's round table. He is a talented voice from Sportsnet 960 in Calgary. Thanks for checking in there, Pat Steinberg. Good to be here. Looking forward to it. That was a uh, that was an eventful week, so we've got lots to talk about. No doubt, no doubt. Opinionated, controversial, but yet always entertaining. From the Hedge Podcast, welcome, Andrew Walker. Glad to have you on our side. Hey, always uh, grateful for the invite, guys. Good to see you. And let's sound that rookie alert. He is the co-host of Locked On Leafs, boo, boo, boo. And, of course, a reporter of the Tired Argonauts. Again, the enemy. Speaking to the enemy, let's say hi to David Morissuti. Thank you very much for the invite. I am glad to be in enemy territory today. <laughs> let's get right to it because, yes, there are a number of things to talk about on this week's podcast. Hey, the BC Lions lose second-year sensation, Nathan Rourke. Guys, I'll come straight at you, Andrew. We'll start with you. Are Grey Cup hopes lost? Are they finished? Or do you expect a little surprise out of Michael O'Connor, the other Canadian quarterback, to succeed in that Lions offensive system? I mean, I do like O'Connor. I think, you know, for all the uh, for all the boundaries that, that Nathan Rourke has pushed, I think O'Connor has the ability to do some of the same. Now, um, you know, this is a guy that was just lighting up the Canadian Football League. I think he's the best CFL story and in what 10 20 years i mean if not even longer um so in terms of gray cup hopes i think you know bc needed all hands on deck to be able to you know take on the winnipeg blue bombers in a in a semi-final or something like that so i don't like their chances but i i i do like o'connor coming in uh, and i'm excited to get a look at him but I, i guys i just don't think it can be overstated just what an amazing story nathan rourke was and what a blow it was to the league. I think you had a lot of people that hadn't, you know, checked out um, the CFL in years starting to perk their ears up because this, this Canadian kid quarterback, I always said um, Johnny Manziel would have been like the white whale for the CFL to get. And they got him and then he was no good. But like what Nathan Rourke is doing, I think in my head years ago, this is kind of what I pictured Johnny Manziel doing. I, it's just been amazing to watch. Pat, you got to be a little disappointed. I think even no matter what team you cheer for or report for, it is a big blow to the Canadian Football League because it was a great story. Yeah, that's just it. And, and, you know, it's a massive blow to BC, no doubt about it. But I think the 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 thing that I felt most was, man, that just – it was such a good story. You've got this Victoria-born Oakville Rays product who is the best story in the CFL. He was on pace for just the sixth 6, 6,000-yard season in league history. And and then for him to go down the way that he did – and and I know that BC's keeping the door open and Nathan's keeping the door open for a return, but let's be honest. I mean, I think BC has to prepare for the fact that he won't be back for the rest of the season and they have to prepare for a, a a vastly different path here and you know i i'm i'm with andrew like i i actually i've i've been really interested in what o'connor can be as a cfl quarterback for well going back to when he was a 20th overall pick in 2019 he his his numbers at ubc were prolific he especially in his junior and senior seasons did a heck of a job limiting mistakes his touchdown to interception ratio was was really strong so i I don't think BC signed this guy by accident. I don't think that BC went into this season saying there's no chance O'Connor's playing and Rourke's playing every single down because it just doesn't work that way. And, and we know in this league backups play. And so they, they were very deliberate in their approach. They went with two young Canadian quarterbacks. They didn't show interest in Mazzoli or Arbuckle or Harris this off season. They were very deliberate in their approach. So they knew there was a chance that O'Connor could play. And I don't think that he's going to be the same dynamic, every down explosive threat 
that Nathan Rourke was, but I think he's a very strong passer. He's more of a traditional pocket passer, drop back guy. But I, I'm, I'm really excited to see what he can do. And, and if you're BC, you've got a talented receiving core. You're eight and one. You're in the driver's seat to get a home field playoff date right now. It's not time to fold the tent. It's, it's O'Connor time. It's, it's not time to start waving the white flag. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens now, despite the fact that without question, this is a really big blow for the league. You know, David, there's a great chance there because they did build up a good cushion with that eight and one record. Um, I'm not trying to take anything away from Nathan here, but, you know, you've got those three receivers that are eligible and quite possibly the first time in Canadian Football League history that they could have three 1300 yard receivers. Is there maybe an opportunity at thinking that this is more the system, David, than than so much the quarterback and that O'Connor can flourish? Um, personally, I, I think like what you see with Nathan work play, there's a lot of things he does on his own to give his receivers the chance to make the plays that they do make his mobility, his ability to kind of move around and just his willingness to go into those tight windows. But I don't think that's something that Michael Connor isn't willing to do. You know, we had him here in Toronto for a brief period. I was a little disappointed to see them kind of let him go after you've had this young quarterback in your system for a few seasons. And I think, you know, for him, what's going to be important is to trust those receivers to know that he's got three dynamic receivers that he can use. So, and he's already been working with them. So this, hopefully the, the drop off in terms of, you know, the rhythm of the offense won't be too bad, but I think Michael Connor can definitely flourish because of that reason. You have three great receivers who can make plays for you when, potentially other receivers might struggle in these situations. I don't know, Andrew, like it, it seems to me that this, yeah, we did certainly have a special guy here running the offense and, you know, there is talk that maybe he can come back and return later in the year. And is this a, a situation where O'Connor really doesn't have to go out and win games on his own? He just basically has to keep the the, the ship afloat in that sense. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, obviously I, I think that's the idea. Um, you know, the, you know, Winnipeg loses a bit of a surprise game. So BC was in the hunt for, you know, that, uh, that home field advantage in the playoffs, but at, you know, they, they got a great cushion. Um, you know, I think it's interesting timing when it comes to Saskatchewan, um, because Rourke went in and basically took their lunch money and, you know, now they play <laughs> again and, and it's a big game for the riders. They catch a big break trying to get back in that, uh, in that playoff race. But, but I, you know, you see it trying to catch Calgary, of course, but, you know, for BC, the, the priority, put it this way, they would rather go into Winnipeg in the West Final with Rourke than host it without Rourke. You know, and Pat, the, the thing is, too, when you look at that the schedule, there were a lot of East teams in the first half of the season for the Lions, and that can't be denied. It's going to get a little tougher for the Lions with that mostly West-based uh, schedule in the second half. Yeah, they were, and and the the one time they've been humbled this season was by Winnipeg with Rourke at quarterback, and they've got more Winnipeg on their schedule. And what's going to be fascinating is the way the season ends for BC. They end with a home and home against Calgary, and and you know I, that that's kind of right around the the time when you know I saw I saw Farhan at TSN talking about it. I know that BC's left the door open and Rourke really would like to. That's kind of around the time that, that maybe Rourke could be able to return in a couple of months if everything goes uh, if everything goes accordingly and everything goes really, really positively when it comes to his surgery and his recovery. But, you know, that we'll, we'll see how things go. We'll see how things go with Calgary's quarterback situation. And it's not like they've been the picture of consistency and, and whether or not Sask, as Wach said, can, can re-enter this conversation. But that home and home set at the end of the year with Calgary and BC could be really, really interesting. And if Rourke is back for one of those games, I think it's a slim chance. It kind of just ups that interest level that much more. Last one to you, Andrew, on this. Do you go out and shop a quarterback. Uh, Antonio Pipkin in behind there. We've seen him more of a runner in this offense. But he was a starter in Montreal for a time. And at, at one time, I thought maybe a lot of people thought this guy could be a good young quarterback and kind of lasted and looked good for a season and then just sort of disappeared. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, you know, from what I've seen, and obviously Rourke was getting all the snaps here, but you just hope that those two guys, um, you know, kind of learned a little bit as, as the understudy. And, and while Rourke deserves a ton of credit, um, you know, Rourke isn't single-handedly you know, 
giving the Lions three, as you said, 1,300 yard receivers. They got a pretty talented receiving core, too. So, you know, I, this comes down to, to coaching. I'd be fine to run with O'Connor and, and Pipkin. Like, you go out and shop. Are, is it going to make you a favorite over Winnipeg? It's not. I think the Lions' destiny is kind of, we know where they're going to finish in the standings. It's all about can Rourke get back for the, for the West semi or the West final. All right, guys, let's keep on with the quarterback theme. Uh, Cody Fajaro ba- basically booed off the field there, Pat, uh, in what was a loss to the Lions. And then Bo Levi Mitchell gets the gets the sheets to – it's mayor time all over again one year later in that tight win against Toronto. Um, which one of these quarterbacks uh, are really in danger of becoming – from QB1 to QB2? Well, it's kind of – kind of pick your poison because I don't know who struggled more in their week 11 matchup because Cody Fajardo Cody Fajardo didn't even hit 50 yards when it came to his final numbers before Mason Fine got his opportunity and and zipped the ball a little bit more and and it, it just looked like the offense was a little bit more in sync but also in that game I don't know if the Riders were ever winning that football game BC was just the better group all night long Whereas the Calgary situation, I, it, it feels like there's more of a decision there. And that's not to say Cody Fajardo and Sask has been great this year because he's struggled. And there's been, there's been stretches where it looks like that knee injury that he's been battling through has been a big-time hindrance for him. Now, it, it feels like the running side of things is starting to pick up when it comes to Cody. And I, I know he barely ran the football um, when it came to the loss against uh, BC. But the week before, he was a whole lot more mobile. So that was a, an encouraging sign for them. Situ- Situation with Calgary is a little bit different because if you're Sask, there's a little bit more, at least in my opinion, a little bit more of uh, a window to stick with Cody because your guy that's behind him is not really a proven commodity. And, you know, I think that you probably want to give that a little bit more time. Whereas in Calgary, Jake Mayer has already started significant games. He started against Winnipeg. He almost beat Winnipeg in 2021 and had a really strong game. And the way things have been trending for the Stampeders and the way Bo Levi Mitchell has been playing throughout the year, it it really gives them a difficult decision. And and what's so fascinating about Calgary's situation is that this will be, if, if they end up going down this road, be the first time Bo Levi Mitchell's ever been benched, ever been sat down uh, as a starting quarterback and hasn't started uh, a game when he's healthy on the top of the depth chart. So Dave Dickinson, who's never been in this situation before, if they go down this road, and Bo Levi, Bo Levi Mitchell, who's never been in this situation before, if they go down this road, uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see how the team and the quarterback responds. If it's well, me, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Pat, I was Pat, gonna he, say. Dave Dickinson has been in this situation before. That's the whole thing as a quarterback. He's, ah. he's, he's sat there in his own spot, yeah, when he was in B.C., and he was a part of a big-time quarterback controversy with Casey, and he's been there before in Calgary. Just as a head coach, he's never been in this spot before. He's never had a decision to make quite like this. And I just – I'm fascinated to see the way that he goes because – there's a lot of loyalty built up with Bo, and there's a lot of winning that's been done with Bo, and there's a couple of great cups and, and two MOPs. But, you know, the, if the, the difference I see Wait, in this pa- one is sorry, that pa- – pa- yeah. That was a pass. That was a pass, though, wasn't it? Like, I mean, just a week ago there, David, like, I mean, this is a quarterback that was lighting up the, the locker room. I mean, and now he did point fingers at himself as well, too. But he was, you know, I don't know if it was uncharacteristic, but he had a lot to say. And that was to the media, to us guys, where, you know, a lot of these guys are pretty vanilla. Uh, David, he was pretty all over the place. And then he comes back the very next week and doesn't perform very well on the road in a a, a team against Toronto, that which I would think Calgary should beat them easily. Yeah, especially, you know, as a quarterback, when you do, when you kind of call up the whole team, everybody kind of looks at, at you as kind of the leader and you have to kind of lead by example. I thought it was going to start off well when you go with the first play and it's 80 yards. You're like, uh, yeah, Bo's, Bo's kind of walk, you know, now walk, taking those words and he's kind of walking the walk. And then it all just kind of fell apart for him. And I like the decision to, ch- to make the quarterback change didn't surprise me just because that was a very winnable game for Calgary because Toronto could not take advantage of those mistakes. So I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, it's not an easy decision for Dave Dickinson to make, but when you look at the fact that the offense was going nowhere with Bo Levi Mitchell in that game, 
it was a very easy decision to go with Jake Merritt. Now, I don't know if that's going to be kind of the same thought process going to this game. They stick with Bo and they can say, look, first sign of struggle, we're pulling the we're pulling the plug and we're going Jake Merritt. So he's already got that thought process in his pocket. So maybe I think that's where and he's had to have that conversation with Bo as well to say this is a pivotal game for us in many ways. If you're not performing, we got no problem going with Jake. I think that's an easy, it's a difficult conversation, but I think it's one that every head coach just has to look at real. No, the reality of the situation where they are and just say, we cannot let this, you know, blindside us. And, uh, and we can't let loyalty be the only deciding factor. Yeah. There's two, there's two different scenarios here. Right. Um, And I think the one in Calgary is you got to have that honest conversation that, you know, Boldy by Mitchell's been a, a, uh, an all-time quarterback in this league for about a decade. The other guy just might be better right now, right? In terms of zip on the ball and mobility, he might just be flat out a better quarterback. And that that's that's tough. I think in Saskatchewan, you know, I don't think the conversation around Fajardo is, oh, he's being pushed by the backup. I, I think you ride or die with with Cody and and you know, you hopefully it's not a lost season. But when he's at his best, it's because he's rushing for 50 or 60 yards, right? And you know, with that injury and him being limited, it's just, it seems to be this domino effect um, with his game and he's not just going to be a, a, a pocket guy. So I, you know, I think for, for, um, for Cody Fajardo to be at his most effective, he's got to be running a little bit. And like Pat said, there was a couple encouraging signs a couple weeks ago, but I don't think he's there yet. Yeah, and yeah, only ran it, only, go ahead, sorry, sorry. Bob, no, sorry Pat, go, ahead. Ran, no, go ahead. Only ran it a few times in the loss to, uh, in the loss to BC. Now, you know, and you're right. They weren't winning that game. Like they weren't winning that game, no matter what. So. And that's why. And that's why I don't know how much, how much I put into, or how much stock I put into what we saw from Mason Fine because that game was out of reach. It's kind of like I don't know how much stock I put into the five passes that Michael O'Connor threw once that uh, once Nathan Rourke came out late in the fourth quarter because that game was BC all the way. So it just it feels like sticking with Cody is an easier decision. The only thing that I would say, just to double back on the snaps, guys is that this is a, a really tough spot. If you're going to go with Jake, there's a, I'm not saying you shouldn't go with Jake. And, and I think the door is more open now than it ever has been. But it's a short week. They go Saturday to Thursday. They have one practice, and then it's walkthrough, and then it's football time. I just wonder if putting Jake in that spot, and yes, he practices at times with the ones, but to put him in that spot in a short week, whereas you can go to Bo, you can say, okay, You've been our guy for now eight years, and you've got an opportunity to re-cement yourself in a high-leverage game against the Bombers. Let's start you. Let's give you that opportunity. And if it goes awry, well, we know which what, what we have to do in-game, and we know what we have to do going into Labor Day. And then you're putting Jake in a better spot, a long week, a long prep week, going into Labor Day in a much better spot against Edmonton. I just wonder if this is not – if, if they decide to go to Bo for week 12 against the Bombers where they have not come home to practice again in Calgary, they've stayed out east, I just wonder if it's a better spot to go to Jake in week 13 on Labor Day as opposed to throw him into this one against the Bombers. And that's why I think it's such a fascinating conversation because I can see both sides. If it's me, I stick Bo for this one and kick the door open and see the way things are going for week 13. I really don't have a feel – on which way Dave Dickinson and the Stamps are going to go, though. Well, Pat, is there is there a chance there may be, and I'm just thinking themes here, and we've seen this in the NFL and the CFL, other leagues, where the quarterback, the veteran guy, sometimes can be better coming off the bench, right? Like you give Mayer the rope a little bit and see if he struggles or whatever, because Jake isn't a guy that hasn't seen this before. Like he's played before, as you talked about, he's experienced enough, played in some big games, and maybe it fires up the veteran to come off the bench and be that guy. I, if they decide at some point, whether it's week 12 in Winnipeg, week 13 against Edmonton or whenever, if they decide to sit Bo Levi down and not start him when he's healthy, I am fascinated to see the way that he responds. Because as we said, he's never been in this spot as a CFL starter before. We know that this is a guy that, is very confident in his abilities. We just talked about his comments that he made coming off the loss to BC. Like I does he react the right way? Does he react? Does he get fired up? Or does does this react? Does it go the other way? And and does it become a situation where maybe it's not great in the locker room and he becomes a distraction and a real controversy? You know, we go back to Walks brought up 
uh, Dave Dickinson and his playing career, you know, that became a distraction at times in BC Huge. with him and Casey Printer. So, like, does this turn into a distraction in Calgary? Does it turn into a controversy? Or is he the consummate team guy? I, and I, I honestly, again, because we've never been in this situation with the Stampeders, I, I honestly don't know which way it's going to go and how Bo's going to react. Last one to you on this, David. It, I mean, Regina, yeah, you're, you're totally correct in the fact that I guess the Doma Gala and Fine, though I thought Fine came in there and moved the offense a little bit in that game against BC. And Andrew, you're probably right. They were never going to win that football game. At the end of the day, though, we saw something in twenty in 2019 where he uh, Cody Fajar was the West uh, MOP nominate, nominee. I guess he lost to Brandon Banks that year. I haven't seen that in a couple of years now. Like, and yes, there could be some injuries. Losing Dan Clark at the center position, probably a huge thing in, in terms of that uh, cohesion on the offensive line. But I'm beginning to get to that point now that I'm wondering if 2019 was a mirage for what we saw in terms of Cody Fajaro. He's also a very emotional guy. We saw what, what he was like at the end of the season last year. I've heard some people say, I, I don't want my quarterback to be that emotional in terms of, you know, uh, criticism to the fans. Like, I, I don't even know right now who the real Cody Fajaro is. Yeah. And he even made those comments uh, saying that his confidence isn't exactly at an all time high. And it's not exactly something you want to hear your quarterback say, I know he's been struggling with the injuries and I feel like that's played a lot into his mindset and how he's played. The offensive line hasn't exactly been, you know, up to snuff there in Saskatchewan. And then you bring in the fact that he's missing two pretty solid weapons and, and Kieran Moore and Shaq Evans, you know, I'd like to see Cody have as close to a healthy offense to play with to before I kind of determine whether he's, you know, if this is the real Cody Fajardo. But at the same time, I think the injury and the mindset is kind of, it's a little concerning, right? And so, yeah, 2019 was a great year for him. Maybe there's a bit of, you, you expect maybe a little bit of a, a drop off in terms of, you know, after someone has a career year like that. But I just want to see Cody Fajardo get that chance with kind of the machine working as well as it can. And I don't think it is right now in Saskatchewan. Yes, Mason Fine did look better in that game, but it was also just totally different circumstances. And I think that that makes it hard to evaluate a quarterback when the situations are totally different. The pressure is totally different for both guys. So um, I, I like to see Cody get the chance with everything going well rather than, you know, coming in when you know Mason coming in when things are kind of a little more lax and BC's just doing their best to make sure that they don't lose the game and they're okay making the quarterback look a little bit better than the other one. And I, I think it's really easy to be kind of down in the mouth if if you're a Ryder fan because you play that that comparable game, right? You play the grass is greener. You're in a really tough division. Calgary is always, I mean, you know, Calgary's quarterback questions too, but they're always going to be this good cultured well-coached team bc unearths nathan rourke who wouldn't love to have that guy and the guy that you had and couldn't stay healthy in saskatchewan is is uh, playing in, in winnipeg and 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 this kind of the the leader of a pretty you know pretty close to a dynasty almost so if you're saskatchewan you're sitting there at five and five you know fajardo um they call it a career season because it happens once that's how it goes um i don't think he's um, I know after 2019, there was this discussion like, hey, is he the best quarterback in the CFL? I, I never quite bought it. So right now they're a middling team with a with an injured quarterback, right? So I, I think that in that market anyway, it's easy for the passion to get riled up and, and it's an easy target right now. They're almost allowing four sacks a game. Let's not forget that. They've got by far the worst O-line in the Canadian Football League. And it's not really given their guy who's hampered a little bit by an injury much of a chance to succeed to, to Dave's point about the machine that that machine around Cody is not clicking on all cylinders right now. So it, it, they, they got to figure out a lot of other things on top of their quarterback too. And does Cody need to be better? 100%. But like his protection has been abysmal this year and it's tough, especially when you're not a, uh, when, when you're his type of quarterback, if you don't have that protection and, and if you're not getting the, the, the type of blocking in front of you that he needs, it, it can really, really go south in a hurry. So there, there's, there's a number of other things at work in Sask as well. Go to this unpredictable, wild, lousy, but entertaining Eastern division. The Argonauts play tight. They, they almost pulled it off against Calgary. 
Uh, the Tiger Cats thought they won a football game, and then they lost a football game against the Montreal Alouettes in a tough game uh, at uh, Molson Percival Stadium. These two teams clash for the next couple of weeks, guys. Tiger Cats Argos ends on Labor Day. It starts uh, this week in Toronto. Uh, Andrew, if you're the Tiger Cats or you're the Argonauts here, Who's the team that really looks like they're going to be on the outside? Because the, the, it, I mean, unless Saskatchewan totally falls apart, it really looks like the crossover is a reality this year. Which team is in more peril right now in terms of making the postseason? Tie Cats or the Argonauts? I think it's the I think it's the Tie Cats. I'm I'm concerned about them. Um, you know, this is a a club. Even the last couple of years, they've been really good. Um, they have made great cups, and at the and and they're still riding this 20 year drought. You know, so I think it's a bit demoralizing. Um, you know, they can't stop anybody right now. They haven't won a game on the road. Um, I, I think that, you know, to add insult to injury, it's not just about maybe potentially losing a playoff spot. It's about losing a playoff spot to a team in, in the West, which is which is a little embarrassing. But, I, yep, yeah, I, I am concerned about Hamilton. You know, if I had to put money on it right now, I, I think the crossover is a is a big-time reality. I think it's going to happen. And I know we have this conversation, you know, plenty of times over the years because, I mean, obviously, if you're a team in the West, the preferable route would go through the East. That being said, no one has ever done it. Like, it's, it's, a, it's really hard to do it, but I would, I would probably pick that poison if I had my chance. It's better than going through, you know, BC and Winnipeg or, or Calgary and Winnipeg. Pat? Yeah, it's and I'm with I'm with Watts and and you know I know that uh, we're talking to a Hamilton host. I just I worry about the way that they have managed football games late and and I know that Toronto let a game go and they were in the lead in the fourth quarter and it was a, an MVT pick six that really turned things around and and allowed Calgary to get back in that football game. But you you take a look at Week Eleven, Montreal went from from their own seven starting with a good return from from worthy and two plays and they went they, they, they moved themselves into makeable field goal territory in the span of less than 20 seconds and Hamilton had this opportunity to pull off a signature win on the road yeah. and put themselves in a great spot going into Toronto and again they let it slip away in the fourth quarter and what, I mean, the, the, the Calgary game and the Edmonton game and now the Montreal game. I mean, they, they have had leads in the fourth quarter. They have been in spots where they should be closing out football games and, and they've let them slip. And, and we don't know what Dane's status is. And, you know, I, I haven't mind Schiltz in, in his, uh, his understudy role and, and he's given he them good. some, he's, he's looked really strong at times and, and, Maybe we have another quarterback controversy, depending on how things go when Dane comes back. I just, I'm a, I guess with the way Toronto's played, as you mentioned, Bubba, they play tight and they've been in a lot of games. And and I guess I just feel like there's two games to go against uh, against Hamilton for them, and and that could really decide the way things go. I just am a little bit wor more worried about the trend that we're seeing from Hamilton of being in control in games and then or being in a position to win them and then let them slip away. So these these two games are going to be fascinating and. All of a sudden, Montreal sitting in a spot where they've got Ottawa three more times, they've got Edmonton once, and they're trending in a good direction. All of a sudden, the, the door's wide open for Montreal to make some noise in these. David, you saw the first two games in this uh, four-game series within five weeks, and uh, as you'd expect, the Ticats and Argos split those two games. You expect the same thing, what's coming up next. And, uh, yeah, looking, looking down the line, uh, which team do you think looks better right now? Yeah, I, I do think that there's probably a good chance that there is going to be a split. Toronto hasn't exactly played well in Hamilton. That's kind of, and especially on Labor Day, that's always a tough place to play. And the Argos have always struggled to win those Labor Day games. So that's why I thought this game for Toronto coming up on, fr on Friday is crucial. Like they have to win this one because you don't want to give Hamilton that chance to leapfrog you in the East. But I look at the schedules for these two teams. Toronto's is relatively easier when you look at the opponents that they play. You got, you know, Ottawa twice. You got potentially a Nathan, you know, a BC team without Nathan Roar, Calgary, Edmonton, and then the last two against Montreal. Hamilton still has a bit of a tough row when they have, you know, Winnipeg, you know, Saskatchewan. That could be a potential game where they see that as a playoff, you know, big playoff game where they have to keep their playoff position alive. So I, I Hamilton's, 
schedule looks really daunting to me. Losing those game, that game to Montreal was also just a killer um, as well. I, I just think the way that Hamilton's losing these games in the second half is tough. I mean, Toronto's now done it two weeks in a row, but it's more so because they just the offense just has has not been there. If they find a way just to get any consistency on offense, they don't even have to score touchdowns. If they just put up any points, I think their defense is good enough to keep them in these close games. And they've and this this is the big thing is they've all been close games. Even with Hamilton, they've been in close games, but I just feel like Toronto is one little element that they need to fit to figure out. It's always been a struggle for them, but I think they realize they're close. They just need that one little thing to go their way. Andrew, I've never seen anything like it. I got to admit, and I could care less if I'm working with the Thai Cats or not here. The, the reality is, with the exception of a game in Winnipeg, the Tiger Cats have been in every single football game. And I have no idea. I mean, I'm not the coach or a, a coordinator, how things break down. And it's not breaking down in the end of the second quarter or in the third quarter. It is in those late stages of the game. And, you know, we're getting some people that are getting called out, and that's coaches and players that are making a lot of money. Um, have you ever seen anything like this? Yeah, it's it's a little nuts. Um, you know, I, I remember, I think it was the Minnesota Vikings last year, a year before, and it felt like they lost about eight games right at the buzzer. You know, they mismanaged the clock. They missed kicks, um, you know, brain cramps from players in big situations. But, you know, there's two types of bad teams. There's the teams that, you know, just don't have the personnel, like, say, the Edmonton Elks. And there's teams that that play themselves into a bad spot, and, and that's what they're doing right now. Um, I remember, you know, you can kind of fool yourself sometimes by saying, hey, we're so close, we're in every game. I remember, you know, a different sport, but I remember talking to a coach. Uh, well, Doug McLean used to coach Columbus, and they thought they were really close because they said, we lost 30 games by one goal. Like, that's how close we are. You know, we're going to run it back, and, and we're just right in the precipice. They came back. The next year, they lost 35 games by one goal, right? So, you know, I, I mean, that's kind of what it reminds me of a little bit with, with Hamilton. Just because you're in these games, you can't extrapolate. and be like, oh, we should be 7-2. and two. You know, those are, you know, those are the moments where good teams become good because you, 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 full, you find ways to win football games. The crazy thing is, with all that you've said and all that I've said, this team are playing in the CFL East, Pat, right? There's still a chance. There's two, still a chance. Two game, two game winning streak. You're right there. They could still win the division and get a buy into the East Division <laughs> final. And and like that, that's that is still very much on the table for them. Everything is still on the table for them. And and it this there there's some similarities to 2021 and what we're seeing here because it took Hamilton a significant part of last season as the defending East Division champions to figure it out. And, and there's still a ton of talent, especially on the defensive side of the ball, guys. Like, we're talking about one of the most, in, in terms of personnel, most talented groups in a long time. This, this core group defensively They're for loaded. Hamilton, is they, they are absolutely loaded. So I still think they've got a chance at figuring it out. I don't know if you'd like – every week I seem to pick Hamilton over at CFL.ca because I, I just – I, I look at that personnel and I like the group they have together so much. It just hasn't come together. The good news to your point is door is still wide open. There is no reason to be waving any white flags right now. Waving the white flag might be the Ottawa red blacks, Andrew. Um, I think we've all liked what I thought they did going into this season but like we've all kind of said, this this it's not something's not working, and their record is certainly what it is. Uh, they're certainly not going to make the postseason. What's got to happen there, Andrew? Well, I, I think you know, though, forget the CFL East, you know, for a second, and the fact that you win three games in a row and you're right back into it. Um, you know, I, I think the watch is is basically just on the head coach um, right now, and I know he said he's not concerned about his job, but. Um, you know, one to two wins isn't going to cut it. I, I think that the, the the only thing I'm looking at right now is can they win three or four games to to save that to save that job because it's just going nowhere fast. Like, you know, you're not as good as the Argos. You're not as good as um, the Thai Cats, and those are teams with three and four wins this season. Pat, not good. Paul Apolice is four and twenty as head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks. And 
look, he got – he had a tough, tough deal to start when he was hired, and then they didn't play a season. And Ottawa was in a spot last year where maybe they held on to a general manager a little longer than they should have. And some of Marcel Desjardins' decisions were – hard to wrap your head around in terms of the way he dealt with personnel and, and some of the personnel he let get away. Uh, but this should have been a year that they took a step forward. And I know that Jeremiah is hurt now, so it's, it's a little bit harder, but you know, even when Mazzoli was playing, they were, they were finding ways to lose football games supposed to win them. And they went out and they at Jalen Acklin has been outstanding. He's proven yeah. that this guy has got number one chops. And, and I think we saw that when he was black, in black and yellow. And, and he's proven that now in red and black in Ottawa. And, you know, William Powell returns and they, they add on the offensive line. Like they should, I'm not saying they should have won the division, but they should not be one and nine. They should not be very clearly the worst team in the CFL. So look, I've always been a huge fan of Paul Lapolis. I love the way that he, worked his way back to a head coach role. You know, he he got fired in Winnipeg. He went and worked at TSN. He became a coordinator again with the team that fired him and and then worked his way back. I'm rooting for the guy, but what what can you do in Ottawa? You're not you're not going to overhaul the team in the middle of the season and and maybe you just you know, maybe you just say there's a lost year and you don't do anything. But, you know, if, if I, I know that Paul's going to say publicly he's not worried because what coach is going to say, yeah, I might lose my job tomorrow. But I, I just I, – I, I don't know if there's any other thing that the Red Blacks can do in season to kind of give them a boot in the behind to, to try and change their fortunes. I mean, I, I, I look what happens with, what happened with a guy that I really – had a lot of time for in Kahari Jones in Montreal. The the decision from uh, Danny Machocha to put himself back on the sideline seems to have gotten things back on a better track in Montreal. And now all of a sudden they're looking at a, a window to win the, the East division. So I don't know. I, I, I think Paul probably should be worried about his gig and they, they probably shouldn't be at one and nine. And there's just been a lot of, there's been a lot of games they've mismanaged and, and let get away as opposed to closing out. Yeah, I, I agree with Pat. It gets to the point where it's like, what are we doing here? I, I love the idea of Paul Lapolis, right? It's a great story. He seems to be a great guy. Um, you know, he's had, he's had some success. He was, he was a pretty good television personality, you know, co- covering the league and, and now he gets a job again, but yeah, you're, you're one and nine. That's Pat said you're four and 20, you know, what, what are we doing here? And, and there's no, there's no silver lining, right? Like you can't be like, well, Hey, listen, at least we're picking at the top of the draft. Nobody cares. Tanking's not a thing, you know, in in the CFL. So you're always, you always have something to play for guys are playing for um, extensions. Paul Apolise is coaching for his job because um, yeah, unless you win, I'm saying at least three games, the rest of the year, that seat is going to be scorching hot. David, here's the thing with, with, with Paul and, and you're right. I think everyone respects the guy, a, a, an outstanding individual per, on a personal basis. Um, I've always seen him as a, sort of a offensive genius guy, a guy that really understands offense very well. And that offense for the Red Blacks is atrocious. Like they're, they're, they're horrible. And now they're, now they can't make up their mind on what's going on in terms of who should be the quarterback and, and, and sticking with the quarterback. I mean, yeah, it really did suck that Jeremiah Masoli went down for pretty much will be the season, but they wouldn't be the first team to lose their quarterback for a season, right? The thing's got to go on. And uh, I, I just can't see what Sean Burke, what options he has at the end of the season, whether he just waits it out. I don't know, maybe firing the coach right now, what that does, but Certainly something – there's got to be some type of directional change, David. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing that likely Nick Arbuckle will get his opportunity in this offense. I don't put all this on Caleb Evans. I think he's shown flashes of what he can do, but he's also a younger quarterback. He still needs time to learn. He's Caleb Evans. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, he, I, I didn't expect Caleb Evans to come in and be the savior. Um but at the same time, you kind of have to know with Jeremiah Mazzoli, there's that potential for him to go down with an injury. He hasn't been able to really stay healthy, which is unfortunate. This is not an injury that was all his fault when you consider the hit. But um, yeah, if I'm uh, if I'm Paul Apolis, yeah, the, the clock is really ticking here. And yeah, if he goes with Nick Arbuckle and he and let's say Nick Arbuckle struggles, I, I don't know where where Ottawa then goes. For them, it's got to be yeah look to next season. I think you, you should start planning now. Like a lot, 
like the Argos, when they made that decision in 2019 to kind of just clear house, they did it with the intention of let's get a head start and try to look forward to the future. I think that's something Ottawa needs to do is they need to figure out, okay, the season looks is pretty much lost. I know they, a couple wins could maybe change that. Although getting even one win has been a struggle for them. I just think that when you look at the East, the East is right there for anyone to take. And I think if you're Ottawa, maybe you just plan for the future and you plan for let's make this something that's sustainable over the long run. And then just trying to worry about this season. And I think the big one has to be, can Paul at please get us there or is there someone else that's better? And I think that's what the evaluation needs to be. Side topic here, guys, with Ottawa, and you brought up the name, which and we're so quarterback centric today, but Arbuckle, like he's played every, like, was he not supposed to be Andrew, like the next great CFL quarterback? I mean, um, well, Adam, Adam to the list of that. We could talk all day about the next great CFL quarterback. Like, wasn't he supposed to be that guy? Like, I mean, we've seen him in, in so many markets now. And I mean, teams that he never even really played for, and then he gets traded somewhere. Strange. Well, it's kind of, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of like the Patriots succession plan a little bit. Calgary was bar none the best organization in the Canadian football league for, you know, basically a, a decade and, you know, and, and the quarterbacks, even the guys that didn't have amazing talent succeeded there. You had Henry Burris and you had Drew Tate and you had, you know, Bo Levi Mitchell. And so here was kind of the next guy, Nick Ar- uh, Arbuckle sitting there. And, uh, you know, he, he has a, he has packages that they run. I mean, he's, uh, he's playing in the playoffs and, and, you know, big moments in a great cup game, one kind of infamous moment, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's kind of like, people salivating over Jimmy Garoppolo a little bit coming out of new England. And finally we got a guy from that organization, from that culture. And Hey, now we're going through it again a little bit with, with Jake Meyer, but you know, you can, you know, the Calgary, um, the Calgary shine can stay on a guy for a long time. And he, and he's good enough that he keeps getting jobs. Right. I think we see this in, uh, in our industry too, or we used to anyway, you're good enough. You're still, you're still getting jobs. Are you good enough to keep those jobs though? Pat, thing with the, the thing with Nick is, I mean, he has not he has not shot the lights out. Don't get me wrong, but he's had a really rough set of circumstances. So he has that year in Calgary where uh, he was he started seven games while Bo Levi was hurt, went four and three in 2019, and was pretty good. Like the, he was very very strong. And the Stamps were in all seven of those games. Bo comes back. Obviously, he's the guy. And then they make the trade. He goes to Ottawa. They sign him. And then he never plays in Ottawa because a contract dispute. And basically, they traded Arbuckle for Nichols. And neither guy really worked out. Nichols was a disaster in Ottawa last year. And and Arbuckle barely played in Toronto. And and part of that was injury. And then McLeod took over. And, and you know, McLeod's a great story and has, and has kind of taken that job for himself. Then he gets traded to Edmonton late. And the last regime in Edmonton didn't play. So you go out and acquire this guy, and then you don't play him. And you're like, okay, well, what are what are Elizondo and Sunderland doing here? They just acquired this guy. And they, so signed, they, they, and they signed him. And then they don't <laughs> play him down the stretch. And now this year, Chris Jones comes in and basically came in and said, yeah, you know what? We got Arbuckle, but I don't really like – like he, he, he said everything but I have zero confidence in Nick Arbuckle – and I'd rather anybody else play the position. And, yeah, he started Arbuckle because I guess he had to. Uh, and then all of a sudden they trade him. And he's barely gotten his shot in Ottawa. And he's, I know he's had some hes had some reps and he's played some minutes and he has not been great. But it's just it's been a really rough set of circumstances for Nick. I would just love to see what he can do for five or six weeks if he's just there and starting and he doesn't have to look over his shoulder or wonder what team he's playing for next or wonder what a head coach is going to say to crush him in the media. I just wonder what it would be like, or, or there wasn't a worldwide pandemic to cancel the season. I, I just, I wonder if there were circumstances that were maybe slightly better for him, what he could do. I know he hasn't been great, but he also has not been handed a, a, a great set of cards either. The yeah, Canadian, yeah, David, the Canadian just radio, develop- Pat. In Canadian radio, Pat, you're Bo Levi Mitchell, and I'm Nick Arbuckle. I, I think that's probably a, probably a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, David, maybe if the guy could just get a relationship with an offensive coordinator, we might be able to see if the guy's any good. But he, he's moving on. I mean, even with the Argonauts, it just didn't last. 
No, it didn't. I mean, the injury put him behind the eight ball there, and that was the unfortunate part. But they, they, when they made the trade to Edmonton, they they put it as salary cap reasons. But I mean, you're not trading a quarterback really for salary cap reasons in that regard. Like you don't want to trade your backup and then leave your other option to be even kind of worse if your starter goes down. But yeah, it's funny how this all works out because he goes to Ottawa thinking like that's going to be his spot, his opportunity. Then they don't want him. He ends up in Toronto. And then Toronto's like, yeah, you know, we prefer McLeod, so we're going to move you. And now he, the wagon kind of brings him back to Ottawa. And, yeah, I would like to just see him get that consistent opportunity. He kind of has to earn it, too. I get that. But this is his shot right now, right? Like, Ottawa at this point is jobs everyone's playing for. And Nick Arbuckle right now is playing, I think, for a job in the CFL. Because I don't think if, if he can't make it work in Ottawa, I don't know how many teams are going to be coming calling for Nick Arbuckle next season, even though some might say uh, maybe he can be a backup somewhere. I don't know. If he can't get anything going in Ottawa with uh, – relatively, he's got some some weapons to work with there. He's got some – There's there are – even though the team is one, isn't doing very well, there are pieces there you can work with. It's now up to Nick Arbuckle to say – to really figure out if he really wants it. And I think that's something that's lacked from him is trying to prove whether he really wants it right now. All right, guys, uh, let's end on this one. And, and I, unfortunately, the timing of our podcast didn't really give us an opportunity to talk about this one, uh, this topic. But uh, I feel like it really deserves some type of comment. Um, Duke Williams, now injured, the wide, fine wide receiver for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, playing Edmonton, Riders Edmonton at, at uh, Commonwealth, catches a touchdown pass, goes into the crowd, celebrates, uh, hops into a seat, grabs a fan's nachos, and starts chowing down. Uh, the That touchdown reception and uh, celebration is shared on YouTube and TikTok and who knows? I mean, we're in this social media world of how many hits it gets. Three days later, Andrew, the dude's fined. Uh, fair or foul? Um, all right. At the risk of being the, the no fun guy, um, I, no! I, I, I cry fair. Um, you can't be... Uh, um, unless you you hand down some restrictions, this can't be a weekly thing. Uh, there's liability issues. There's you know fan safety. Um, it, what you are know, you a lawyer now? It's le- that's true. It's like listen, it, it, it's it's fun, um, but we can't have guys trying to you you are crossing. Look at the you know we all we saw basically fights in the stands between the Ty Cats and Argos last year. Anything involving uh, the fans, especially in some of these blue collar CFL markets, I, I think that you are asking for trouble. So have fun, celebrate your touchdowns, stay out of the crowd. I'm not upset by it, but I, I get it. I'm not going to, you know, it's, it's like in the NFL, the celebrations are great. And then when Joe Horn starts pulling his cell phone out of his pocket or, 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 or someone pulls a Sharpie, like let's, let's not carry items around the field. Like there's a slippery slope here. Pat. I don't know. I like, I like if you want to find them, I guess if the, if the CFL is thinking marketing, it keeps it in the spotlight a little bit longer because well, we're fighting him because he did this. I don't think that's what they were thinking. Um, but it was it was a it was a really good celebration, guys. It was uh, and whether or not he had that planned out in advance or not, I thought it was pretty good. It looked pretty spontaneous to me. And I, I've always been one of those guys that I remember going way back to the early two thousands, and and they changed rules because of the the Stampeders and and Jermaine Copeland and and Nick Lewis and Kenyon oh, Rambo yeah. and and that group of Stampeders. They, they had the bobsled and the the relay, and it's like. You're like, okay, these guys are clearly planning these out and choreographing them before, but they were good. They're fun. This league needs more spotlight on it. This league needs more meme-worthy or viral things. So I didn't have a problem with it. I was actually – I didn't even think anything of it when I saw it. I'm like, oh, yeah, Duke's Duke's one of the be- best guys to do that. He's had two or three of those celebrations would end up on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. You're like, okay, that's well, just well, one of the, one of them was One of them was X-rated. 
Yes, one of them was uh, was NSFW. But I just like, hey, it's it's good for the league. So when I saw they find them, I was like, oh, what, the celebration, the nacho celebration. Like that, it was a little surprising. So I I liked it. If they want to find them, I, but I just hope it doesn't uh, deter Duke from doing it again. David, are you working for the league office too, or, or what's going on here? I, I've been a little split on. I, I thought maybe you try to give a warning, but I think because it was already put into place after what happened in Toronto last year, like the league just does not want anything like that to, to happen. They were following the rules. Dave's yeah. right. Like it was very much by the book. Yes. Right. <laughs> and so like, I, I'm all for trying to get, trying to have more sociable moments in this league, marketing moments in this league. And that's, that's one of I don't know why they didn't. You know, I, I would say if I'm the if I'm Saskatchewan, I, I'm I, I you know I remember with uh, with the Dallas Cowboys and Zeke Elliott jumping into the little uh, uh, Salvation Army. Uh, I, I guess you call it the belt, like the 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 thing that they had on the field there, and he got yes. fined for that too. But like it, it makes for great you know viral moments that can go and give your league a little bit of exposure. So if I'm Saskatchewan, I'm setting up like a Duke Williams lounge that's away from the fans and he can just go in there after he scores a touchdown. Like you can get creative like that. And kind of in a way you're saying to the CFL, okay, you want to find us when we do it within the stands, we're going to find a way to do it. That kind of stays within the confines of the league rules. I, I think it's, you can find a way to be creative. Just maybe watch, watch out for those potential moments where it could come back to bite you. I mean, look, Winnipeg. They, I hear a lot of Winnipeg uh, uh, Saskatchewan fans complain about the players jumping up in the crowd in Winnipeg. I said I don't think an, an opposing team player, a visiting player, would ever want to jump into the crowd in Winnipeg after they score a touchdown. So I think that's a little bit of a different situation, especially when you taking somebody's food and all those things. But. <laughs> I think you can, I, I have no problem with trying to get creativity, but maybe don't, maybe don't put in the CFL in the position where they have to, you know, t- be the no fun police there. I mean, Andrew, isn't it, isn't the, isn't sports supposed to be entertainment too? I told you liability, liability. <laughs> I like it as much. I like it as much as anybody. You can't go into the stands, man. Have you seen some of these CFL fans? You want to go into Hamilton or Saskatchewan or or Edmonton, man, I don't want to be in the stands with some of these people. Go back to your shanties. <laughs> you know, you know. The funny thing is, I I thought it looked to me like the and it, it was an Edmonton crowd. It looked like the, those whoever had their nachos stolen looked like they were okay with it. They were all laughing. I just know, I just know, if you steal my nachos, I might be throwing a few rights. So you got to be careful, <laughs> as you can tell. Up in a drink, even. <laughs> Oh, guys, that was a good one there. Well, inter- interesting situation there for the Canadian Football League. Yes, they followed the rules. And, uh, you know, it did sound like they had a GoFundMe, uh, some type of account there to uh, help out the, the $5,000 fine is what it was reported at. So regardless, we all have a little fun. And having a little fun here, guys, talking CFL with the uh, three great guys here. And we really appreciate your time. Pat Steinberg, where do we find you? And uh, follow your uh, lead in, the, in terms of the media side of things. Uh, on uh, CFL.ca, if you want to uh, hit up the Monday morning quarterback, Sports Dead 96 of the Fan here in Calgary on radio and uh, on Twitter at uh, Fan960 Steinberg, if you're so inclined. Walker, where are you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AWOKS Official, and uh, my podcast is called The Hedge. You can find it on thehedgepod.com. It's on Apple, it's on Spotify, it's on. Uh, YouTube, check it out. We had Nathan Rourke on a couple weeks ago. He was great, so hopefully we didn't jinx him. But lots of good content and a few uh, betting tips as well. He can you find the edge Andrew. on his shirt as well. It's a nice shirt you're wearing, Watts. Thank you. Oh, yes. look I'll, at that. I'll, like I'll, I'll send you guys some shirts. I'd well, like some merch, for please. You know what, Andrew? Let me just ask you a quick question on this because this is something that certainly I think the first year that we're really seeing this. How how has the public really uh, adopted to this sort of you know um, you know wagering on CFL? Is 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 it a hot thing right now? I, I you know I I think that um, it's it's tricky for me to say because I've bet on sports for 20, 25 years. You know they were always part of my Pat knows this. There are all it was always part of my um, you know radio shows and analysis long before it was kind of mainstream you know people went down the street and got their you know their sports select ticket but they didn't really know how easy it was to to wager online i just think i've always thought this i think that 
you know, the way, and we've seen this with the NFL, um, the popularity of certain sports is just um, enhanced greatly by betting and fantasy. Um, gone are the days where, hey, you'd go to a couple CFL games a year and it was in, and this goes for any sport, and it was in your market. Well, I live in, you know, I live in Calgary, so I'm a Stan Peters fan and I, you know, I, I might see a team on TV or something, but now you get access to everything. You see every player and every sport. You, right. you can watch it, you know, on your phone. You can watch it, um, you know, in, in your living room, no matter where it is. So all of a sudden, you know, you are a young kid in Edmonton, per se. You can be a Nathan Rourke fan. Why not? So, you know, when, when fandom isn't tribal, you're looking for things to cheer for. That's why I've always loved fantasy football, right? Um, you know, I, I, I'm taking Cam Newton today, so I'm the biggest Cam Newton fan, something like that. And betting is the same way, right? I, you know, I, I don't have great feelings for the Toronto Argos, but if I need them to cover, you know, minus eight, like go Argos <laughs> go, I may as well be a season ticket holder. Well, I always thought that's why the NFL kind of qu quietly kept the business going on. I mean, because and I think the CFL can certainly be enhanced because you're right. All of a sudden, games that you wouldn't watch, you're watching. And I think we'll be watching the Thai Cats and the Argos there, David. So where do we find in? Keep up on uh, what's going to be going on in a very, very busy couple of weeks here. Yeah, you can uh, find me on Twitter at D underscore Morsuti. You can uh, go and subscribe to my sub stack where I... You know, we'll have a lot uh, heading into this matchup. And uh, you'll also find some of my work at sportsnet.ca as well. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Hey, uh, CFL fans, you, as you know, we're here every week, starting on Monday, Tuesday this week, technical difficulties. Regardless, find us all the time on wherever you get your favorite podcast. Always on YouTube, like, subscribe, get that notification going. And uh, we're talking CFL, and we're looking forward already to a big week of games leading up to Labor Day. As they say, Labor Day, the season and the CFL really kicks in, and we look forward to driving you right through to the end of the season and through to the playoffs. Bubba O'Neill here on the Ticats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week. Catch you next week. The CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. Subscribe, like, and get the deepest takes on Canada's game every Monday.